I am Tanya Bryant with the DC Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, the district's financial regulator and consumer advocate. Thank you for coming out to today's presentation on an update of the National Flood Insurance Program, insurance program changes and its impact on DC. On behalf of Acting Commissioner Chester McPherson and the staff of the DC Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, we welcome the opportunity to work with our sister agencies the District Department of the Environment, the DC Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, and the District Silver Jacket team to discuss financial related topics like flood insurance with the community. We will have remarks from the District's flood plane, insurance coordinator, Pitmano Panavong, followed by Richard Sabota, insurance specialist with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Padmano Panavong. Um, I'm with the District Department of the Environment. Uh, my role there is the uh, DC National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator for the, the district, and um, we are, you know, coordinating with FEMA, especially FEMA Region Three, on um, on the program like uh, mapping uh, size and. Um, regulatory size and also, you know, coordinate with other agencies like this be on the in insurance uh, side of the program. As you may know that the program have the regulatory, the mapping and insurance size. So we joined the program since 1985 under the regular program. Mm -hmm. So the DC residents and property owner can have the federally backed flood insurance um, through, you know, entire city since we joined the program. By joining the program, the district, you know, promised to regulate development in a mapped floodplain area that you may um, um, realize that we have, you know, certain area that designated as a uh, special flood hazard area or the 100-year floodplain. So that's kind of our role at DDOE to kind of coordinate the program on the regu regulatory and mapping and and the insurance um, outreach like that. And thank you for coming, and I'll, I'll be here uh, to to support um, Rich and uh, DSB and, you know, me, and answer some questions that you may have related to a program. Thanks, Pat Mano. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Rich Sabota, and I'm representing the Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Region 3 office. Uh, FEMA has 10 regional offices throughout the United States. Mine is located in Philadelphia, and FEMA Region 3 serves Delaware, the District of Columbia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, so I travel a lot. It's good to be with you today, and I want to uh, thank my partners with the Department of Insurance securities and banking for uh, allowing us to be together today. Um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation that I'll be going through in just a little while. Um, hopefully you uh, picked up a copy of this presentation. I've been with uh, FEMA only since uh, 2008, uh, but I've been working uh, on behalf of the National Flood Insurance Program in one form or another since 1993. Uh, so I've uh, seen a lot of changes in the program, uh, nothing to uh, compare to what we've seen over the last few years, and uh, the uh, impacts of these changes are really what I want to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> to give you uh, some background and history about the program, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if you're not aware of it, uh, this program has been around since 1968. Uh, it was created by Act of Congress and there were a number of reasons that this program was created. Uh, prior to 1968, matter of fact, uh, all through the history of this country, flooding events were occurring, and of course floods can cause some pretty significant damage. Floods are by far the most uh, likely cause of damage in this country. Uh, but prior to 1968, there was no flood insurance available in this country anywhere at any price. It did not exist and had not existed since the 1930s. So uh, in the absence of flood insurance, if people had flood damage, uh, the only things that they could depend upon was the kindness of their friends and neighbors, uh, the uh, <clears throat> mechanism that we call federal disaster assistance. And federal disaster assistance is, of course, your tax dollars and mine at work. Uh, so responding to uh, federal events 
prior to the creation of the National Flood Insurance Program was an expensive process and it all came out of our tax dollars. So one of the reasons the program was created was to make flood insurance available again. <coughs> and uh, we've been pretty successful in that regard. We've got over 5 million policies in force throughout the United States and its territory. Uh, it was also created to cut down on the amount of disaster assistance that was being spent for flood recovery. Uh, because, of course, uh, a person with a flood insurance policy pays a premium, and if they have a loss, they get paid out of the premiums that have been collected by the program. And, of course, that saves tax dollars, and over the years we have literally saved uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars in tax uh, monies that would have otherwise been spent. So in that uh, regard, it's been relatively successful. <clears throat> um, from the very beginning of this program, this program offered certain subsidized rates. And those subsidized rates were offered to the owners of properties that were built before this program uh, came into existence in their community. It's what we call pre-firm structures. And the acronym FIRM, F-I-R-M, stands for Flood Insurance Rate Map. And the uh, program, among other things, is responsible for creating a flood insurance rate map for any community that's participating in the program. But before a uh, community got its first flood insurance rate map, of course, uh, there was uh, really very little information available about flood risk, flood damage that may occur. Uh, so most structures that were built before uh, the community got its first flood insurance rate map were not designed with flood in mind. Uh, they are uh, likely to be damaged and damaged severely. Uh, but in order to make coverages affordable for the owners of that property, or those properties rather, from the very beginning, we offered them subsidized rates. And it was all about making sure that the product was affordable to those people who needed it the most. <clears throat> Newly constructed uh, buildings in those same areas uh, do have to meet certain uh, requirements for building construction and materials, and those are structures we call post-firm. In other words, built after the community got its first flood insurance rate map. Post-firm structures are not subsidized. Uh, they do uh, have full risk actuarial rates applied to them. And about 20% of the policies that we write are subsidized, the remaining 80% are not. Um, but the ones that are subsidized, unfortunately, again, are the ones that are most likely to suffer significant and severe damage, and those are the most costly ones to insure. <laughs> I'm going to give you the financial history of the last 10 years of the National Flood Insurance Program in 60 seconds or less. This program worked relatively well financially uh, um, with uh, subsidies in place. Uh, when we fell short, as we did from time to time, we took a loan out from the U.S. Treasury. So the program has borrowing authority from the U.S. Treasury, and we took out loans and we paid those loans back with interest. And that process worked pretty well up until the year 2005. And of course, what happened in 2005 was the single most catastrophic event in the history of the National Flood Insurance Program, Hurricane Katrina. And as a result of Hurricane Katrina, we spent, uh, paid out in flood insurance losses uh, more than $18 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, in flood losses, and that $18 billion figure represents more than we had paid out in the entire history of the National Flood Insurance Program prior to that. And unfortunately, we did not have $18 billion in the bank to be able to pay those claims, so we had to take out a loan. And so we did. And uh, that loan is uh, uh, still outstanding. Uh, we have been paying down interest on that loan, uh, but uh, keeping in mind that we take in about $3 billion, with a B, dollars a year in premiums, uh, even if we were to have a number of years without loss, it would take us quite a while to pay down that debt. And uh, of course, that's not the way things work. Uh, so the uh, Congress became pretty concerned about the finances of the program and uh, began discussing how best to reform it, and they came up with a piece of legislation called the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012, or BW-12. BW-12 made a number of significant changes in the program. Uh, one of the things that it did was, in some cases, uh, 
outright eliminate rating subsidies. And those cases were for pre-firm structures uh, that were either newly insured or that changed hands. And the uh, result of Bigger Waters 2012 uh, called uh, unintended consequences uh, really was to uh, kind of bring the uh, real estate market to a halt in certain areas. You can understand as a seller or a buyer what would happen if uh, uh, you found out that the premium on your flood insurance policy was likely going to be more than your mortgage payment, and in some cases it was far more. So Congress uh, took another look at the situation and they came up with a second piece of legislation called the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014, or HFIAA. And the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act uh, left certain pieces of the Bigger Waters 12 legislation in place and changed others. And the general approach of the 2014 legislation was to uh, create a more gradual uh, elimination of rating subsidies. So uh, I had uh, some recognition of the affordability factor. And so uh, looking forward, uh, we are implementing certain pieces of the Bigger Waters 2012 legislation and also certain pieces of the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act. And uh, I'm gonna go into some of the detail for you and sorry, I took longer than 60 seconds. <clears throat> All right, so uh, in transitioning from the 2012 to the 2014 legislation, uh, one of the first things we had to do, of course, was to stop the rating mechanism, which was based on outright subsidy elimination. And we did that in pretty short order. And uh, as a result of that, we actually retroactively changed the rating process. So people who had paid full risk rates uh, during the bigger waters 12 uh, rating period actually wound up receiving refunds of premiums and those refunds were all sent out uh, the, during the last quarter of uh, 2014 and uh, we took care of that pretty quickly and one of the few actions of this program that I've never heard a complaint about was people receiving refunds on their flood insurance policy so that's good. Uh, another uh, significant change that we're in the process of taking place is implementing uh, certain revisions to our mapping process. Uh, I am uh, the insurance guy for FEMA, uh, but there's actually two other very important components of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, one of them is uh, risk analysis, or the people who create the flood insurance rate maps or firms that we use. And the other component is floodplain management. Any community that joins the program has to have certain requirements in place in its building ordinance uh, to make future construction and high risk areas for flooding as safe as it can possibly be under the circumstances. So uh, three major components of this program are flood insurance, uh, flood insurance rate maps, and uh, floodplain management. And Petmano is fortunately here with me today if you ask any hard questions about mapping or floodplain management. I'll be looking at him very quickly. Uh, we also are required to devote uh, some time to come up with additional mitigation strategies. And mitigation is our term for reducing, if not outright eliminating damage that may occur from the peril of flood. And there are a number of things that individual property owners and communities can do uh, to mitigate future flood risk. And I won't go into too much detail at this point. Uh, we'll probably touch on some of them as we're going along. Um, last but not least, and brand new to the program, the 2014 legislation requires us to designate a flood insurance advocate. And I'll be talking more about the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate in just a little while. The uh, slide on the screen is uh, at least understandable enough to say that there are a number of moving pieces to our implementation of legislation and they are occurring over a timeline. Uh, in some cases, the legislation required us to implement certain strategies by certain dates. Uh, in others, uh, uh, the uh, timeline was uh, less well-defined, but uh, uh, from April 2014 to uh, April 2015, uh, quite a number of movements of uh, legislative requirements have been put into place. Some of them are still under development. 
Uh, some of them will be implemented further along in time. Most recently, and uh, uh, important for the uh, understanding of how this program functions, uh, FEMA does not service its own product. FEMA works through uh, 80 or 90 companies uh, that we refer to as write your own companies. And the write your own companies are all, all of the insurance companies whose names you are familiar with, State Farm, Allstate, Nationwide, Omaha, Selective, on and on and on the list goes. And those companies are under agreement with the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. They write and sell and service flood insurance on our behalf. They, ask, uh, they act, rather, as our fiscal agents. And so anytime there's major changes in the program, especially in its rating and rules, uh, we have to send out guidance to the Write Your Own companies, and they come out in the form of Write Your Own WYO bulletins. And a Write Your Own bulletin was sent out in October of last year, uh, which outlined the changes that the Write Your Own companies would need to have in place in its rating software and its other uh, uh, computer systems to become effective to implement Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act rating in April 1st, 2015. The, uh, in addition to the rate tables, um, we have also been required by the legislation to apply to policies uh, surcharges and I'll be talking about rate changes and surcharges in just a little while. Uh, in terms of affordability, uh, one of the things that the uh, legislation al allowed us, indeed required us to do, was to institute or to offer a $10,000 deductible for property owners. Uh, Previous to that, the highest deductible we had offered for private property owners was $5,000. Uh, so the $10,000 deductible uh, is available, and uh, as you know, the way the deduct deductibles work, uh, the higher deductible, the more you save on your premium, but of course, if you have a loss, that's more money that's coming out of your own pocket before your policy kicks in. So uh, we try to uh, very carefully uh, advise our clients in terms of the deductibles and we certainly are very dependent upon our write your own companies and their agency force to do the same thing. Uh, in practice I don't believe there's been a hot, heck of a lot of takers on the $10,000 deductible so far. Um, the uh, question of grandfathered rates I'll talk about in just a little while and there was one more uh, pretty significant change on how we rate policies for structures that are newly mapped into special flood hazard areas. And FEMA is not only responsible for creating a map for a community, FEMA is also responsible for updating that map from time to time. And under any other circumstances today, I'd probably be standing before you in a jacket and a tie. Uh, but instead I'm wearing FEMA blue, and that's because directly after I'm done here today, I'm going up to Harford County. We're having an open house for the citizens of Harford County because we are introducing a revised flood insurance rate map there, and we get together and we can uh, talk to people face-to-face, one-on-one, and answer their questions. The uh, reference to TMAC, TMAC stands for the Technical Mapping Advisory Council, another requirement of the legislation. Uh, while FEMA has done the best uh, job it possibly could uh, in terms of remapping, uh, there have been suggestions that we should be uh, getting other entities involved in that process, and so we have. Uh, the Technical Mapping Advisory Council uh, invites a number of expert uh, stakeholders in the mapping process. Uh, they began meeting uh, in October of last year and they will be meeting on an ongoing basis. The idea is to come up with uh, the best way for FEMA to proceed uh, in terms of remapping communities in the future. And that's going to be an ongoing process. And as I mentioned before, uh, refunds uh, owing to the overcharges of Baker Water 12 have already been mailed out. Now, Coming effective April 1st, 2015, we instituted new rate tables and new rating rules, and they uh, really reflect some very significant changes to the way we do business. Uh, the uh, premium structure uh, under the Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act calls for premium increases annually, but also sets some caps 
on those premium increases, and I'll give you a little more detail on that as we're going along. It also uh, increases uh, or provides for increases uh, for structures that are non-primary residences and also structures that are uh, considered to be severe repetitive loss. And severe repetitive loss structures, of course, are those structures that have uh, had a number of flood losses in a brief period of time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have now instituted under legislation a reserve fund. And going back to our uh, um, financial borrowing as a result of Katrina and later on as a result of Sandy, uh, one of the things that this program does not have that most insurance enterprises do is some type of reverse reserve fund. A reserve fund or a rainy day fund, as it were, was not uh, allowed for in the original uh, enabling legislation for this program, uh, but a reserve fund is now in the process of being set up. Uh, future losses of a catastrophic nature, uh, we may have more money on hand to pay for those losses. Uh, more about the reserve fund later. Uh, the surcharges, again, I'll talk more about later and the uh, procedures for newly mapped properties. I'll get into a little more detail as well. Uh, this past May 1st, we sent out another Write Your Own Bulletin, and the Write Your Own Bulletin in this case alerted our companies to changes that would be upcoming in the program effective the 1st of November 2015. And uh, while there are no rate changes uh, effective November 1st, 2015, uh, the changes that we are instituting are going to be setting us up for rate changes because one of the requirements of the legislation was that we institute a 25% annual premium increase on businesses. And we have been unable to do that so far because uh, our uh, underwriting guide, uh, guidelines prior to the uh, passage of this legislation did not break out businesses uh, as a separate entity. Uh, we have only a uh, residential and a non-residential and an other residential category, uh, but to actually separate businesses and determine who should receive a 25% premium increase and who should not has been uh, impossible so far. So we are changing our forms uh, and our underwriting guidelines to be able to identify businesses so that we can be in compliance with legislative requirements in the future. I don't expect you to be able to read this slide. I left it in here simply because, as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts to this process. Uh, and again, some of which have already been implemented, some of which are in the process of being implemented, and some of which are still on the drawing board and will take uh, probably some years to be able to implement. This is, was a very comprehensive package of changes to the program, and I've been with the program, as I said, for well over 20 years at this point, and it's been taking me a while to wrap my head around some of these changes. Uh, so I'm glad I'm being taped today because uh, maybe if you didn't get it the first time, you can watch me and get it the second time. Another slide that I left in simply for the visual effect, uh, again, there's a number of different things that are uh, uh, moving hopefully in the right direction, and uh, as time goes by, we'll be implementing more and more of the legislative requirements of uh, BW12 and Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. All right, so uh, the uh, refund, as I've already mentioned, uh, that has been taken care of. That was, needless to say, a very important piece of us changing uh, uh, to the uh, more recent legislation. We wound up sending out a million refunds, and uh, um, I believe it was $100 million in uh, actual premium refunds. So, um, we uh, uh, started off with a bad financial situation and we made it a little worse by uh, sending out refunds, but certainly they were due to the policyholders. Getting back to the uh, changes in legislation, uh, rather than an outright subsidy elimination in some cases, we are going to a more gradual rate uh, increase slash uh, subsidy reduction, and again, there are certain sub-limits to those increases. The legislation requires us, per rating class, to increase our rates no less 
than 5% annually, no more than 15% annually, with certain exceptions that I'll go into in just a little while. Legislation goes further to say that we cannot increase any individual property owner's premium by more than 18%, but again, there are some exceptions to that rule as well. And that uh, briefly takes care of premiums. I'll get back to that in a minute. Premiums are separate from the second consideration, and that second consideration is surcharges. Newly created by the 2014 legislation are surcharges that must be mandatorily applied to every single policy that we write, and those surcharges come in one of two amounts. Be $25 for any primary residence, $250 for any other policy that we write. And again, keep in mind, these began to be implemented 1st of April this year. So we've only got a few out in the field there uh, and uh, we'll be changing our entire book of business to uh, reflect those surcharges. Uh, the surcharges are there, quite honestly, to make up for the premium loss from the uh, change from BW12 rating methodology. Uh, so we gave up some premium, needless to say, and resulted in refunds, uh, but we still owe 18. Actually, at this point, it's around 23 billion with a B dollars uh, as a result of additional borrowing from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so uh, Congress's intent quite clearly for both pieces of legislation was to begin to bring the financial order back to the National Flood Insurance Program and over time in establishing a reserve fund and also in applying surcharges, we should be able to turn the boat around, but it will needless to say take some time to do it. The exceptions to the sublimits that I mentioned previously for uh, rating increase, uh, any older business property that is a business property insured with subsidized rates uh, will receive a 25% increase. Keep in mind, however, that we're not able to isolate business properties at this point, so those rate increases won't actually go into effect until 2016. Older non-primary residences, again, these are subsidized policies, and we do send out a questionnaire with every new business and renewal offer, which is about determining whether the structure to be insured is a primary or a secondary residence. Uh, if it is a secondary residence and the structure is pre-firm, we will increase premiums 25% annually, and that structure will also be subject to the $250 surcharge. Uh, so you're talking about some pretty significant uh, change in dollar figures. Severe repetitive loss properties, as I've already mentioned, uh, will be seeing the 25% increase annually, and that buildings that have been substantially damaged or improved will also be seeing a 25% annual increase. How long do those annual increases go on, you may ask Rich, and Rich will say to you, it depends. What does it depend upon? It depends upon something called an elevation certificate. The only way we can establish what a full risk actuarial rate is for any structure is for the property owner or someone else to provide us with a completed elevation certificate. And what an elevation certificate does really is to provide us with a number of different elevations uh, for the area, for the structure, and all of those elevations can be combined to come up with a premium rate for a structure. The basic comparison that we use is base flood elevation and lowest floor elevation. So, base flood elevation, the concept is how high does FEMA expect water to rise during a flooding event, a flooding event of a certain magnitude called a 100 year event or a 1% annual chance, which is the uh, standard for this program. Uh, through the 
studies of hydraulics and hydrology and the map making process, we can determine uh, with fair amount of accuracy what the base flood elevation is, how high water will rise, and once we know that figure, then we're interested in knowing what is the comparison of the structure's lowest floor to that base flood elevation. Uh, easy to see that if a structure's lowest floor is below base flood elevation, during a base flood, it's going to take on some water, sustain damage, we're going to have to pay out money, so it's going to be more expensive to insure. Conversely, if a structure's lowest floor is above base flood elevation, it's much more likely to come through a flooding event with little, if any, damage, and that structure will then, again, be less expensive to insure. But we don't know what that relationship is without the elevation certificate, and up until uh, recently, uh, we always required an elevation certificate for post-firm structures, and we did not require an elevation certificate for pre-firm structures. Uh, but now, because we are required to increase rates until we re reach full risk actuarial rates, uh, one of the best pieces of advice that we can give any property owner who owns an older structure in a high risk area is go out and get an elevation certificate, uh, because that's going to answer awful lot of questions. And in some cases, it may actually wind up saving the property owner money because the subsidized rates may actually wind up being higher than the full risk rate. But we don't know that until we've got an elevation certificate to provide a full risk rate for that structure. The general rule in the National Flood Insurance Program is we will give you the lowest rate that is available to you, no matter whether it's pre-firm or post-firm, subsidized or elevation rating, uh, but we can't give you an option unless we know what the elevation information is for a particular structure. So we are encouraging people to get elevation certificates and uh, I think you're gonna see more and more of that in years to come. Map grandfather rules have been a part of the program for a long, long time and it's really all about what happens when FEMA changes a map and that map change reflects in a zone redesignation. Now, FEMA on its flood insurance rate maps uh, reflects a number of different zones. Some of them are uh, labeled with letters, some of them with letters and numbers, but it's really all about us trying to depict areas of high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. And so, if a structure is in currently in a map that shows it to be in a low or moderate risk, and we change that map, and it is now reflected to be in a high-risk area, how do we treat that in the future for rating purposes? And the answer is, again, it depends. There are two types of map grandfather rules that have always been a part of the process. One of them relates to st structures that have been continuously insured through the National Fund Insurance Program. As long as a property owner keeps a policy in force, even if there is an intervening map change and the property is now in a higher risk area, we will allow them to use the prior map for rating purposes. We will grandfather them into the previous map rating, and that remains true as long as that policy is in continuous force. So we do like to reward loyal customers. The other type of grandfathering that we use is something called built-in compliance. I mentioned before that communities are required to have certain standards for new construction and substantial improvement in the high-risk areas. And as long as a community is enforcing its building requirements, if a structure is built in compliance with a map that is in effect at the time of construction, and we change that map later on, we will allow that property owner to retain the rating that they had under the map that was in effect when the structure was built. And that right retains, uh, remains in effect continuously. It does not depend upon continuous coverage. <clears throat> Years later, a new property owner can buy a flood insurance policy from us and still be grandfathered into that original map as long as they have not substantially improved the structure or as long as the structure has not been substantially damaged. The Bigger Waters 12 legislation was going to do away with map grandfather rules. Fortunately, that never happened. 
The Homeowner Flood Insurance Affordability <laughs> Act reversed field on that, so we have MAP grandfather rules restored. They work just the same they always did, but keep in mind that premiums will be increasing in the future, more or less. To confuse you a little more about MAP changes and rating, in some cases, it actually benefits a property owner um, to be redesignated to a special flood hazard area because they get, for the first year of premium payment, what we call preferred risk rates. And we've got two products. We've got a standard flood insurance rate, uh, which is typically written in the high risk areas. And we've got a preferred risk policy rate, which is typically written in the non-high risk areas. And it's important for everybody to understand that we do write flood insurance both in high and in non-high risk areas. Uh, and the difference in flood likelihood there is a question of degree and good or bad luck. Uh, but for those structures that are newly designated to a special flood hazard area, we have a new procedure called newly mapped. The property owner will get the preferred risk rate for the initial rating period following the map change. And after that, they will be subject to the annual increases allowable under the uh, legislation, but it's still going to be a lower premium than if we had rated them or re-rated them uh, directly to a high risk rate. So uh, the uh, newly mapped premiums in most cases will be less than the grandfathered rate. Uh, but if they reach a point where the grandfathered rate is less than the newly mapped rate, we will allow them to take advantage of the grandfathered rate. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces. And one of the things that I can tell you is all of these changes um, are very much dependent upon the knowledge of the agent and the company that are writing these policies. And agent education is and has been for a long time uh, a pretty major concern of the National Flood Insurance Program. One of the websites that I'll be sharing with you a little bit later on relates to uh, a video webinar and other types of training that is available for insurance agents uh, to become more familiar with the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, and one of the things that I do in my spare time is talk to insurance agents and I'll be happy to get involved in any type of agent education opportunity that may present itself. Just briefly on mapping, uh, the mapping or the technical mapping advisory council uh, is number one about kind of changing the way we do mapping and involving more people in the process, more different experts and entities. And it's really all about additional outreach and communication, especially with our congressional offices. So we try to let people who are affected by map changes uh, know long and well in advance that a map change is upcoming so uh, they can be aware of it and prepare for it. And as I mentioned, the Technical Mapping Advisory Council is in place and there are ongoing quarterly meetings. The Flood Insurance Advocate Office that I mentioned, a brand new concept in the National Flood Insurance Program. And I'm going to show you the language in the legislation that relates to the establishment of this office in just a minute. Uh, what is uh, current at this point is uh, we have established an interim flood insurance advocates office, and that's one of the websites that I will share with you in just a little while. Uh, and we are in the process of converting that interim office into a permanent flood insurance advocates office. And the language that relates to this particular office uh, that is everything that was said in the legislation about the establishment of this office, uh, kind of some broad guidelines. So we are trying to uh, come up with a way to uh, uh, provide some further definition in terms of some of the requirements of the legislation and make sure that we are uh, filling the, uh, the need uh, that Congress saw in the designation of a flood insurance advocate's office. Again, I don't expect you to read the script. Just a few additional topics, and then I'm going to open up for questions. 
Uh, I've already talked about the NFIP reserve fund that's ongoing. Uh, at this point, 15% of all of the premium that we collect goes into our reserve fund. So at some point in the future, we'll have a rainy day fund. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the insurance mechanism, most private insurance industries also have a, um, a uh, drawing a blank on the term, but it's insurance for insurance companies. What's the Reinsurance. Reinsurance, thank you very much. Yeah, folks, okay, it's live. All right, so uh, the uh, reinsurance treaty is part of most uh, property and other uh, lines of insurance. We never had a reinsurance treaty in effect. Uh, the legislation did require us to do a study on reinsurance. That study is already completed to my knowledge. I don't believe we will be getting involved in reinsurance for a number of different reasons. I've uh, mentioned the $10,000 deductible. Uh, legislation does require us also to offer at some point monthly installment payments. One of the ongoing complaints about this program is uh, we ask for all the money up front. Uh, so we are required to establish a monthly payment plan. The problem is that this is one of the changes that requires us to go through the federal rulemaking process. And those of you who are familiar with the federal rulemaking process know that it can take some time. So it's somewhere in the process. Ongoing at this point is an affordability study that was required as part of the legislation. Uh, Congress knew that in the process of uh, increasing rates, increasing premium rates in this program, uh, there would be some folks who would be pretty severely and adversely affected by premium increases. And the requirement of FEMA is to have an affordability study done. Uh, that study is ongoing. It's being done by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the first report has been put out. A uh, second report is due at the end of September of this year. I've got a uh, website address for you if you want to take a look at the status of the affordability study. Once that study has been complete, that study will be used to inform an affordability framework that FEMA must also come up with, that is uh, certain specific requirements in terms of uh, what property owners are being adversely affected and how best to address the needs of those property owners. So an affordability framework will be pre presented by FEMA sometime probably during 2016, but uh, I'm not real sure of the timeline on that, but uh, we are aware of the affordability issues that increasing premiums uh, bring along with them and we're working on it. Last but not least, and the reason that I'm with you today, uh, there is never enough time and resources to do outreach. And when you are looking at the magnitude and number of changes that we're talking about today, uh, the time that we're spending hopefully is uh, a beginning point for anybody uh, in this room or watching from uh, the cable TV channel. Uh, this is the information age. Uh, there's an awful lot of information out there and people can really uh, educate themselves uh, by use of a number of our websites. And uh, on that happy topic, uh, the first uh, listed website is um, all about the flood insurance reform changes that are part of the 2012 and 2014 legislation. So uh, anybody can go on that website and get all of the detail on the changes ongoing that I did not share with you today. And that site is updated on a regular basis. Uh, there is that uh, little elephant in the room uh, that relates to uh, Hurricane Sandy claims and lawsuits in New York and New Jersey. Without going into too much detail, we have established a procedure uh, for offering to any claimant who feels that uh, their original claim was not settled properly uh, to request that the pro uh, claim be uh, looked at again. Uh, beginning Monday, I believe, we're going to start sending out letters to uh, uh, potential uh, 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 claimants who uh, may wish to take us up on our offer and uh, uh, more to follow on that. But uh, there's been a 75-person task force that's been stood up um, to begin the review process on those. Uh, 
unclear to me at this point uh, where it's going to go, how many people will be interested, how long the process will take. Uh, what I can tell you is that we are doing everything within our power uh, to make sure that the sun is shining into the claims process and uh, um, going forward uh, there uh, will be renewed emphasis on the customer focus that this program really should be designed upon. So um, more to follow on that one. Um, the bottom website here is all about the interim office of the flood insurance advocate so you can get more detail on the responsibilities of that advocate's office. Next page, uh, I mentioned before, training. Uh, there are any number of training venues and certainly uh, an awful lot of need for training for insurance agents, uh, for lenders, for people in this room, for all of the stakeholders of the National Flood Insurance Program, and they are numerous and varied. Uh, again, uh, we've got some training resources out there and one of the things that I promise you I will do if you've got a need for training, as long as they will finance me to come and visit you, I'll be happy to do that and I'm happy to be here today. Uh, the Technical Mapping and Advisory Council uh, uh, doings can be uh, uh, updated to uh, the bottom website address there. Couple more, I mentioned the National Academy of Sciences and the Affordability Study. You can visit that website and read the initial report and see what the proceedings are. And last but not least, certainly not least, um, anyone who's never been on www.floodsmart.gov, if you do nothing else, spend about five or 10 minutes on that website. Uh, it's been around for a while. It is intended to be consumer friendly, uh, it's all about education, outreach, and hopefully uh, marketing of our product, uh, and it would be time well spent for you. Thank you.